Good evening. This is Mae Bressel on KAZU-FM in Pacific Grove, California. This is broadcast number 590, March the 28th, 1983. That went pretty fast, that one, didn't it? <laughs> Can't believe when the end of these months rolls around. I, I've been trying to start the broadcast each week with a resume of what we were talking about just one year ago. Uh, sometimes I lapse and forget to do that. There's so much news just for the week that I can't even think about a year ago going down memory lane. But David Emery called me and said, do you know what was happening just a year ago today on the 28th? And he reminded me of an interview I did for the San Jose Mercury, the magazine section of San Jose Mercury. Many of you subscribers have that. If you don't have it, you can write to me and send a self-addressed stamped envelope, and I'll send you a copy of the article. There was a cover page that said, Hitler is alive, the federal government killed John Lennon, Ronald Reagan is a front man for the forces of evil. If you don't believe it, just ask Mae Brussel. And then it goes on, the article's an interview about opinions I have on these various officials and upon the entire era, and some quotations of my opinion of the uh, Hitler escape when he left Germany which is timely because of the new report of the dental records and the lying about the identification to fool both the Germans and the Allies. And there's much more evidence that Hitler escaped than there is that he was murdered. In fact, there wasn't any evidence that he was murdered. So along the John Lennon lines, because of the Hitler story and also the new information about the CIA, the FBI, the State Department, and immigration harassing John Lennon and trying to nail him and get him out of the country, this is what I had to say about John Lennon. This was in March, on March 28, 1982. The interview was that just a year ago to this date. The John Lennon assassination. His death was a well-constructed plot that involved careful manipulation of Mark David Chapman through hypnosis and the use of mind control. Starting with the Beatles, the anti-Beatle propaganda, then he became a fundamentalist Christian. The church sucked him in, as they do the Moonies and these fundamentalist groups and do brainwashing on them. The church sucked him in. Then the CIA took over. If, if it wasn't that the CIA was the church front at the same time, there was that chronological order uh, that is a flip of the coin. Which one began first is the church, the CIA front. But in any event, he... Uh, had been taking acid and joined a fundamentalist church group and then became violently anti beetle The church took over. During Chapman's travels to London, Hawaii, Israel, Hong Kong, and Korea, he was in the specific cities where people identified with the murder of John Kennedy, the Kennedy assassination, all have bases. Why Lennon? The Reagan administration intends to make war on various soils, and John Lennon's energy was the greatest force for peace demonstrations. It was their desire to prevent a repeat of the demonstrations of the 60s. Now, uh, you can see in one year our escalation of troops in Lebanon and El Salvador, in Guatemala, Nicaragua, the Honduras, and all over the world, as I think the U.S. News Report said last week, 40 wars going on. The United States has armed 20 of them. They're going on right now. So a year ago, I was talking about the Hitler escape and about the importance of having to murder John Lennon at the time Ronald Reagan became president of the United States. I'll do more on Lennon uh, probably the second half of this broadcast or maybe before the first side is over, the first half hour. But I just want to make a few comments about things that are happening in the news right now. The San Francisco Chronicle Examiner on Sunday had a large section on religious beliefs and holidays. And they brought up the fact that this evening is Passover, the first night of Passover for the Jews. Friday is Good Friday. Sunday is Easter Sunday for the Christian religions, a holy week for the uh, uh, Judeo-Christian tradition. And along with the religious report just in one day's newspaper, FBI new guidelines alarming how they're going to take off the restrictions that came after Watergate and the investigation of the FBI that was tailing John Lennon and many, many others. In fact, recommending assassinations or murders if necessary to take away leaders like Martin Luther King. The, Ronald Reagan has now released them to begin their COINTEL program in domestic United States again. Another story about a murder in Golden Gate Park of a man who disliked blacks who shot a white woman sitting with a black man in Golden Gate Park. The public defender tries to make out as so much of a bizarre mental case. It is par for the San Francisco police, the LAPD, for many police stations around the country to see that these interracial romances or friendships are broken up with the bullet. 
So they have, uh, this is a rare thing when these racist killings have been going on constantly. Another story, U.S. quietly working on nuclear-controlled war. Ronald Reagan has accelerated the development of weapons in an obscure Pentagon corner of a budget. There's $26.3 billion set aside for 1984 next year for the development of a system of having limited nu- nu- nuclear weapons that would last for just a few months and not one big bang to go out real fast. Another story, Salvador pilots are dropping napalm on rebels. A Dr. Charles Clements, C-L-E-M-E-N-T-S, he was graduated from the Air Force Academy. He was in Vietnam. He's now a doctor treating burns. He tells how these bombs are striking the ground. They don't explode. Then there's a ball of flame, and people are burning badly. He worked with napalm in Vietnam, and he said the American troops are using with El Salvador napalm there. Then wide use of doomsday chemical, the night news services, the same day as all this Christian literature and Jewish literature about the holidays. The dioxin peril, this is uh, San Francisco Chronicle, the dioxin uh, chemical is 2,000 times stronger than strychnine. It's 150,000 times more deadly than cyanide. There have been over 200 accidents of dioxin, 27 sites in Missouri alone. 245T, you know, that a chemical that kills weeds has dioxin. There was in Love Canal, a Hyde Park. 12 million gallons in Vietnam were sent down there with Agent Orange, dioxin and Agent Orange. Dow Chemical uh, is killing the fish in various rivers, and as you know, the environmental people are covering that up. These are just some little things that our Judeo Christian society accepts. And I, I don't understand why, but that's just everyday news. That happens to be from one day right alongside the religious column. I noticed in the paper this morning that Dow Chemical is spilling uh, dioxin, 64 million gallons of water daily in um, in the Michigan, Saginaw Bay, and so forth are being dropped by Dow Chemical. And they wa- warn the Jews and the Chinese, a warning on carp used in gefilte fish will pass over starts tonight. The Jews have gefilte fish, and um, some make it themselves, but the fish, even if they make it themselves, could come from Michigan, and they're warning that there's dioxin, and that uh, they better be careful of the gefilte fish. Remember about 10 years ago when I was on the air saying that dioxin was put into the feed of chickens for the school programs for blacks in Chicago and in Detroit, Michigan, that they were singled out where the feed went into their food. Well, now it's gefilte fish time. I'm sure that there's other people eating fish out of that area, but it was interesting on the night of Passover that they had that story. Uh, Am I religious? In a sense, but nothing like that kind. I grew up in that experience of the formal kind of religion, and the Judeo-Christian religion has done nothing to stop the arms race, the escalation of wars, the concern for these wars in Southeast Asia and all over the world where the military dictators' ships are uh, put into power by the CIA and by Jews and as well as Gentiles. And I have turned my back on that hypocrisy. Totally, I won't have any part of it. Am I religious? Yes, in a way. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty lucky with synchronicity. And this weekend... Here on the Monterey Peninsula, we had Peter Caddy speaking, and I went to see him yesterday, Saturday, and took the afternoon off. Peter Caddy was the founder of a place called Finhorn. Many of you know of it. Maybe you don't know of it. If you don't know it, you can get a book that describes the magic of Finhorn. It was written by Paul Hawken, H-A-W-K-E-N, Bantam book, came out in 1975. Uh, Mr. Caddy went with his wife and three boys in a trailer. He's British. They call it a caravan. They went up to northern Scotland and lived on $16 a week food for the family of five and waited there, uh, not knowing which course to take. They dropped out of society and went to a place where there's nothing but wind and snow and nothing grows. There's sand. There's no soil. And they sat up there. This was 1962. So the year before Kennedy was murdered, and maybe we needed a Finn Horn or a Peter Caddy or an Eileen Caddy in this world because certainly the message of Finn Horn has spread around. And his wife began to get messages. A lot of you don't believe in the spiritual, the psychic, or, or that kind of phenomena. I happen to believe in it very strongly that, that these things happen. And his wife was given instructions. He had never grown a garden in his life. And she would get messages, and then he would follow them through. And they grew probably the most fantastic garden on planet Earth. There is a garden down in Mexico that has such things, but this is the most famous. And what he claimed was that the forces 
between him, the chemistry between him and his wife and his family and the earth created message that she received. He didn't receive them. She gave them to him and told him what to do. And they began to plant and they were getting 40 pound cab cabbages and eight foot tall rhododendrons and roses that were growing in the sand in December that have never been seen anywhere else. And they began this garden where people come from all over the world and it's been written up in many, many places. It's called Finhorn. And it was very nice to see him. And, and I understand what his wife, Eileen Caddy, was feeling. I identify with what she did. It was sort of like the garden grew out of nowhere for no reason at all. And it reminds me of certain messages that I got or get on what to do and where to look for research and how to go about it. So as a housewife with five children, just minding my family's needs, all of a sudden I went into something much bigger and began to meet people from all over the world who bring me books and documents and articles and subscriptions. And we correspond in the cross-section of World Watchers is as great as the cross-section at Findhorn. It, it, people who visited there tell you of every nationality, every walk of life, every kind of profession, and that's kind of what evolved here. All of us, just through love, you, you can't be paid to do this kind of work. There's nobody on a salary, and I don't even ask for grants because uh, I think they'd want to control what we did or what I said. But just out of love for humanity and love for truth and love for the world in general and seeing a hurting world, I spoke up, and then it was, you know, two people and then four, and I've been on the air. This is my 12th year. So that now I'm deluged with telephone calls and mails and tapes and people are catching on and it is a love and I can understand how Eileen got her messages, things would come to her, things were told to me, that doesn't mean it's research, it doesn't mean it's fact, but I knew what books to go to, where to look for it, how to go for it and I proceeded to do it in the same way that she did so I could identify with her and I never met Peter Caddy, I heard about Finhorn. So the spiritual side of me was satisfied the same week as these Holy Week rituals of mumbo jumbo. And I did get to see this gentleman speak and he's with another young wife now. And it's inspirational to know how people can follow their instincts, get off on a limb, be next to having next to nothing and giving up a lot of the things that you think you need and getting very close to what the world is really about and it's about feeling and it comes from the inside of you out you can't get it at libraries if you don't have it in you but once you have it in you you know where to look for the material so that was a great experience this weekend now just a moment on fritz kramer i got a letter from congressman leon panetta he's been working for me thank you for that there are good men in congress the house of representatives and he has located according to a letter march the 11th that came this week Dear May, I have located a source of a picture of Dr. Fritz Kramer taken in 1970 at the time he was awarded the Meritorious Civilian Service Award, and I got the address in Washington, D.C. of where to send for the picture. I sent for the money. I sent the money for the picture. They have one negative. It was taken by Louis Reinhardt, February, tw February 27, 1970. I sent a check for 1750 for three five by seven glossies. Now I have a picture of Hitler's Fritz Kramer full face when he was 45. This one would be 69 years old if it was taken in 1970. So our search may be over if it's an entirely different person. But there's one loophole that they can hold back. Um, he was given this award in the Pentagon. I didn't see any pictures of Henry Kissinger or anyone present. There's no search name or any newspaper report of his having this event. We've gone through all the various means of library work of researching it out. There is one restriction on photographic records that came from the Defense Audiovisual Agency. They said these records may be made fully and readily available unless... Their release is precluded by statute as an application of the Privacy Act or Freedom of Information Act or precluded by current and valid security classification. So if we can't see his face, you can better believe I'll scream all the way to Washington and Representative Panetta will know it. So unless they pull that clause, if they pull that clause, we can absolutely be sure because if he gets a meritorious award after advising all the top Nazis in the Pentagon to put in dictatorships all over the world, if he's getting that award 
he, we want to see his face. We certainly see that ugly Kissinger's face plenty of time. And I want to see the master, the granddaddy of this whole thing. So we'll know. I've sent off the check. I'll keep you up on it. Incidentally, when I went down to L.A., I was down there a couple of weeks ago. I have some favorite bookstores along the coast as you go down here from uh, Carmel down to L.A. There's used bookstores along the way and off side streets. I didn't have much time and I didn't have much money. So I ran into one of the bookstores quickly because now I know what I want. And I said, do you have any books by Peter Drucker? That's the guy from Vienna who said that he brought Fritz Kramer to this country. You know about him. If you don't, you'll have to get the back tapes on him. And the man who has the used bookstore said, well, I used to work for Westinghouse, and Peter Drucker was required reading for all the employees at Westinghouse. Now, he must have been pretty high up because I'm sure guys that just fixing washing machines and dryers, et cetera, don't read Peter Drucker. But he was some kind of an executive at Westinghouse, and it was required to read all his books. And I said, then you must have read about Fritz Kramer. He said, I know who he is because Drucker in his book, one book at least, tells how he brought Kramer to this country, and we've talked about that. He didn't have anything. There's nothing to read by Fritz Kramer, but he didn't have any Drucker books. So then I asked one more question. Do you have any books by or about Charles Willoughby? And at that point, the man in the bookstore, who owns the bookstore, said, who are you? Now, I'd come in the bookstore many times before, but people worked for him. I don't know if I saw him or the other employees, but I would go to the shelf, take what I want, pay and leave. And they didn't even, ex they looked at the cost and that was it. But when I mentioned those three names, he wanted to know, why do you know them? How do you know them? And I didn't use the German name of Charles Willoughby. I just said Charles Willoughby. So he said, you know, the three are Nazis. And that's very interesting because we have described Charles Willoughby as the chief of intelligence for the Pacific area, for the uh, Vietnamese War, for the Philippines, for the signing of the treaty with Japan. The whole Pacific action was in the charge of a German who changed his name, fought with Franco, and then went to Douglas MacArthur. The Eastern War, the European War, is in the charge of John J. McCloy and Fritz Kramer, Henry Kissinger, winding down the war and colluding with the Nazis after the war with General Patton and so forth. So they carry the European theater. And the multinational corporations that are going to strangle this country and buying up and gobbling up the individual small businesses is the expertise of Drucker. So he identified them. As he said, you know they're all Nazis. And I said, I know it. That's why I asked you about them. Now I'm going on to a subject I haven't done for a few weeks, but several, uh, three important stories relating to the shooting attempt, the murder attempt on the Pope in 1981. The NBC broadcasting has been pushing the Bulgarian connection, the Marvin Kalb area that we've talked about, along with our intelligence agents like Michael Ledeen and Claire Sterling and Mr. DeBorsch Grave and so forth. They have been pushing the Bulgarian story just as far as they can go in spite of a lot of European evidence that it was right-wing Nazi uh, plans to shoot the Pope. And I can see why the right wing would do it, because then they would make martyr the Pope and he had the network set to blame the left for this particular murder attempt. Well, NBC, according to San Jose Mercury, this is March 24th, 1983, NBC says that CIA agents in Rome are under investigation. NBC says, since when is our propaganda machine NBC? Why not the Justice Department? Why not the CIA? Because the CIA, the NBC is the appointed agent for this shtick. And then NBC says the CIA is under investigation. New York byline. The Reagan administration is investigating the CIA station chief in Rome and two of his agents who have disobeyed orders in connection with the investigation of the Pope, NBC News said. The three whom the network by law did not identify, raised the ire of officials in Washington because these men would refuse to stop discrediting the so-called Bulgarian connection. They refused to stop discrediting the truth. It would be like at the time John Kennedy was killed, where investigative journalists say, no, Oswald didn't work with the Cubans, with Fidel Castro. He worked with Army intelligence, Navy intelligence, NASA, the Nazis, which he did. So these guys in Rome, there's three there that are making trouble for NBC's story and the CIA. Now it goes on, quoting an unidentified source, key administration source, NBC said, the three may have to be fired from the CIA work over there because they disobeyed orders of National Security Advisor William Clark, 
who's from the Sovereign Military Order of Malta, the military branch of the Vatican, and CIA Director William Casey. William Casey, another Sovereign Military Order of Malta, knighted by the Vatican, working with Lysio Gelli, Michael Sendona, Pope Paul VI with the Milan Mafia, and this current Auschwitz Pope from I.G. Farben. These these men, with their links to the Vatican, directly to the Vatican, don't want the people in the CIA to negate the Bulgarian story because it was decided by Mr. Casey, it was decided by Mr. Clark, that the KGB wanted the Pope dead because they're anti-Christ and the Pope was making trouble in Poland. That was the cover story. But as they investigated in Europe, the ire of Reagan is mad, and you can believe it. Now, what they're mad about, the NBC said that the Rome CIA agents may have downplayed the Bulgarian connection because they can't, they don't want to draw attention to an alleged close working relationship between the CIA and an Italian labor leader who was arrested as a Bulgarian spy. Now, that Italian labor leader is a fellow that worked with Lech Walesa. His name is Luigi Scriccioli. I can't pronounce it. We'll, we'll go for Scriccioli. I'll spell it L U I G I. S-C-R-I-C-C-I-O-L-I. Striccioli. Okay. He worked with Lech Walesa. He was linked to the Red Brigades. He is involved with this story, and he's the CIA man, and they had a close relationship of this man to Lech Walesa, to the Red Brigades, to the CIA, and by uh, working on this story, they have uncovered this relationship. And the second reason is that there's a possible use of guns and drug smuggling route between Sofia, Bulgaria, and Milan, Italy, to run CIA agents into Eastern Europe. Now, the CIA agents in Eastern Europe go from Milan to Bulgaria to in through Europe, and what these guys did in putting down the Bulgarian plot was then there's nothing left but what exists, which is the Munich, the Frankfurt, Germany, the fascist, links of Aja to the Grey Wolves, to the Hitler Youth, and so forth. So the president is mad. NBC is mad. They're blowing the story, these three CIA people, and they're going to maybe be brought home, and they're under investigation for not carrying the original cover story and not lying out of their teeth. Now, the New York Times has an interesting long story, if you want to look it up, on the Bulgarian connection and the defectors and the shooting of the Pope. This was the March, just recently, a full-page story from the New York Times, March 23, 1983. The Attack on the Pope, New Link to the Bulgarians by Nicholas Cage, C-A-G-E. But in the course of his trying to link it to the Bulgarians, he has... Again, the defectors leaving Bulgaria and working for Radio Free Europe. And you read John Loftus's book and the Belarus the Secret, and you read about the Nazis and Radio Free Europe and propaganda. The people that he wants to link the Bulgarian plot to leave Eastern Europe to work for the CIA and for the Nazi war criminals who run Radio Free Europe. Now, in the New York Times article, he not only links those defectors to the CIA and the Nazi war criminals because they leave Bulgaria and go directly to that propaganda outlet of our United States government, State Department. But he mentions the right-wing links. One, I've mentioned them before in the air. One is Becker Selenk, B-E-K-I-R-C-E-L-E-N-K. He's a link of a jaw to the right-wing terrorist activities. He was extradited from Germany to Italy last year. And the other person with him is Musa Celebi, M-U-S-A-C-E-L-E-B-I. Celebi was the middleman, the middleman between Selenk and Aja. And Selenk was warned by the Italians for arms smuggling, narcotics traffic. The men that were working with Aja are linked to arms dealing, to drug dealing, to Milan, Italy, to the Banco Ambrosiano, to Roberta Calvi, to Michael Sindona, to Paul Marcinkus. This whole ball of wax are into smuggling. And what they were going to do was to sacrifice this pope. Hopefully he would die. Then they could have a full-scale act of war as the Lysio Jelly Masonic group, the P2 group that were kicked out but still remained, the Coral de Sierra, the newspaper there, what they wanted was to get the Pope, sacrifice it, and use him as a symbol for an act of war against Eastern Europe. 
Now, there was a death, to culminate the, just these three stories on this subject, there was a death last month, February the 15th, of the head of French intelligence who was also working in Rome. His name is Lieutenant Colonel Bernard Nutt, N-U-T. San Francisco Chronicle has a story Saturday, March the 12th, 1983. The mystery, mystery surrounding the death of top French secret agent. At first they said it was suicide. Then they had to come to the conclusion it was murder because there were suspicious footprints and you can't get up and walk away when you're dead. His gas tank was empty. He was killed from a distance. I mean, I know you have long arms there, but not that long. He was active with some Lebanese, a millionaire Lebanese and his daughter, who this guy has a hotel in Cannes. He worked in Cannes and Nice. He was in Italy, and he seems to have been, according to this story, the main source of information about the Bulgarian link to the Pope shooting in May of 1981. So how convenient on a dark, snowy road face down, the main link to the Bulgarian connection was dead, working with French intelligence and also working in Italy, found dead February the 15th, and now the CIA men that are not accepting the Bulgarian story are going to be brought home. If you kill enough witnesses, as they did in the John Kennedy assassination, we researchers caught on to that a long time ago, if you kill enough witnesses and you tell enough lies and nobody is left, then you come to the conclusion it had to be thus and so. So if you fire those agents and you kill this primary witness, what are you left with? A Bulgarian story. Uh, finally, before I get on to John Lennon and review for you what's happened in the new story about the uh, government going out after John Lennon, I just want to tell you about one article that I have here on Gulf and Western because I've been hitting that for the last three weeks on the air. Well, Houston Post has a story, Death of Gulf and Western Founder Stirs Wall Street Interest. You better believe it stirs their interest. It tells about Mr. Blue Dorn, who came from Vienna, from Austria, when he was 30 years old, he had his million, which we talked about. 25 years ago, Gulf and Western never existed, the Houston Post said. Today, they have sales over $5 billion. Uh, and it tells about how he went to Houston, Texas, near the Gulf of Mexico, and took up the word Gulf. Uh, he had one company in Detroit and takes on the term Gulf. But then here's an interesting uh, way they worded exactly what I've been trying to say about Mr. Blue Dorn and Gulf and Western. Gulf and Western became one of the most well-nurtured babies in the corporate world. As Papa Blue Dorn fed it company after company. In a period from 1965 to 1970, he scooped up and bought 80 different companies. Last week, I just talked about his connection with Howard Hughes, with Michael Sedona, the Hughes Empire, the Capitol Records, the Beatles music. He scooped up 80 different companies. I looked some of them up. They listed a few. We can spend a few weeks on 80 different companies. New Jersey Zinc, I mentioned, South Puerto Rican Sugar, Brown Paper, Consolidated Cigar, that's the Dutch Masters, the Muriel, Kaiser Roth, Paramount Pictures, Madison Square Garden, New York Knickerbockers, New York Rangers, Roosevelt Parkway, Raceway, Arlington Park, 30% interest in stock in Munsingware, Esquire. Remember Esquire and Clay Felker of the CIA and the effort they made to put, they had a whole article on uh, Sherman Skolnick and myself putting us down while they buy Simon and & Schuster and cover up the real story of the Watergate connections. Amfac, General Tire, Mohasco, J.P. Stevens, United Brands, Hammerhill, Hollywood Park, Amoski, you know what that is? Central Soya. I looked them up in the Standard and Poor's. There's all Amfac is in Hawaii. That's the hunk of sugar in Hawaii. Amoski looks like a dummy front. It's in Boston. It's called a holding company. It's one of their huge banking fronts. J.P. Stevens is woolen and synthetic cottons and, and so forth. Munsingwear, you know, is long undies, underwear, sleepwear, loungewear. Mohasco Corporation is tables, dinettes, furniture for institutions, Hammer Hill paper, that's in Erie, Pennsylvania. Central Soya is in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and uh, is Standard Poor Livestock, poultry and feed, soybean meal, and so forth. He's into that. Brown paper, Brunswick, he's in charge of, buys into Brunswick. Uh, this corporation is for leisure time products, bowling, fishing, homes, accessories for boats, equipment, high technology, uh, aerospace and defense applications floor and wall covering all bunched together. Hollywood Park, you know what that is, General Tire. Hayes Albion, that's in Jackson, Michigan. 
That's sand and shell cast, perlotic malleables. It goes into casting, automobile and truck engines, die casting, knitting machines, metal furniture components, etc. Then the New York Times had a story going back, this is a few years ago, on some of their possessions. Because see, out of these 80 companies, Madison Square Garden is one out of the 80 he gulped up. December the 11th, 1977, a story of his holdings in Madison Square Garden. We'll take a break now for one minute. I'll just finish the Madison Square Garden holdings and Mr. Michael Burke I mentioned last week, and then we'll get on to the John Lennon story and the news this week. Okay, this is broadcast number 590, May Brussels in Pacific Grove, California. It's March 28th, 1980. The December 11th, 1977 article about Gulf and Western Industries has a chart of Madison Square Garden Corporation run by David Werblin at the time. Remember, that's the fellow from Music Corporation of America that was instrumental in being an early agent of Ronald Reagan's. It, and it goes into the sports and entertainment run by Michael Burke, then senior vice president, later became president of Madison Square Garden. That's the fellow that worked with William Donovan in the OSS and the CIA and was used to help overthrow Albania as the first test case of the Americans doing a coup in a country that was none of their business and how he worked at Warner Brothers and worked with the uh, circus and worked with the intelligence community and then goes on to, to work for Gulf and Western while well, they have combined with Michael Sindona from the Vatican, always keep that in mind, selling 50% of Paramount. Michael Burke was senior vice president of sports and entertainment in charge of Madison Square Garden. He was general manager of the sports group, the Knicks, of the Rangers, of all the boxing there and all the boxing matches, of all the ice follies, the holiday on ice. In addition, the uh, Gulf and Western and the Madison Square Garden was in charge of two Hilton hotels in Chicago at the O'Hare uh, Park, the Hilton, and the Arlington Park. Remember, Mr., maybe you didn't know that Conrad Hilton was also a Knight of Malta, Sovereign Military Order of Malta, along with Mr. William Casey, Reinhard Galen, Hitler's uh, Chief of Intelligence for the East, who formed our CIA, and Mr. Uh, Clark, William Clark of the National Security Now. They also held the Roosevelt Racetrack in Long Island, the Washington Park in Chicago that burned down in 1977, the Marshall Field property, the shopping center, 100 acres around the Roosevelt Raceway in Illinois, 120 acres around Arlington Park in Chicago, and so on. So just the subsidiary of Gulf and Western with Madison Square Garden was just one of his holdings. So Gulf and Western is a large, large uh, corporation that I suspect is linked to the Borman Brotherhood to the money to put in that was released by the Nazis to uh, put into a person like this who, as I say, gulped up 80 corporations in five years and had 20 to 30 percent in many, many of the major corporations in America. Now, this last week, there was a lot of concern or news coverage about a Los Angeles Times story that broke March 21st, 1983, written by Roxanne Arnold, R-O-X-A-N-E, Arnold. FBI tailed Lennon to get him deported, the documents disclosed. Uh, this has to do with the lawsuit that's been filed by the Civil Liberties Union to get papers on John Lennon and what it was that the government was doing to him and what he was doing to the federal government. FBI agents feared former Beatle John Lennon would lead a peace demonstration. They feared that against Richard Nixon. So he was followed for months before the 19... Uh, 72 Republican convention in Miami. They hoped to arrest him on drug charges. There was widespread activity to catch him in illegal activity. They monitored his appearance, appearances. They kept tab on his private life. FBI wanted him arrested, if at all possible, on narcotics to deport him. They kept a log of everything he did from the early 70s. Lennon's controversial songs were in their file, his anti-war songs, his peace marches, reviews of his, con of his concerts, and also information from the counterculture publications. That's where we come in, Paul Krasner, who was a friend of John and Yoko Lennon, and they, of course, with the counterculture realists, were the people that put up $5,000 so that John Lennon knew that he was being investigated at the time, and they wanted to understand the government. That's why they were helping Paul Krasner. And we were talking about the conventions down there that John and Yoko weren't going to attend anyway. And this was the first published account of Nixon with Nazis in this country and the CIA involved in Watergate and 
many of you have or should have if you don't my first published article why was martha mitchell kidnapped the lenins put up the money so that this article could go to press so they were interested in counterculture publications and the point is that the documents now have been crossed out and they won't let um the information be public even though there's no reason it's not national security to want to know about what John Lennon was doing in this time period. Now, J. Edgar Hoover worked with Robert Haldeman, according to this news account. What the news account doesn't say is that J. Edgar Hoover was vice president of Interpol. This Mr. Weiner, Ron Weiner, who's doing the John, rather, J-O-N-W-E-I-E-N-E-R. He's a professor at Irvine College doing a book on the politics of the 60s. And he wrote for Freedom of Information to get the Lennon files. What he doesn't have or what they don't put in, the missing part, is that Ginger Hooper, who wanted to get John Lennon, worked with Interpol. It was a Hitler police organization, a network all over the world to spy on informers and keep information, not drug traffic, but information of, again, the counterculture, the resistance people. J. Edgar Hoover was vice president, and, of course, along with Interpol, so valuable to the CIA, was Klaus Barbie and the Nazi death squads. And in Washington, Mr. Caulfield of Watergate fame and G. Gordon Liddy worked for the IRS and for Interpol in Washington. J. Edgar Hoover worked with Robert Haldeman, according to this Los Angeles Times story, which we all know. What it doesn't have, and I'll tell you the parts left out of the Haldeman story, is that Robert Haldeman, as chief of staff under Richard Nixon, worked hand in glove with his goon squad, which was Mike Kerb and Ken Reitz. Kerb is the appointed, soon-to-be heir, say, to the throne of the White House someday. Mike Kerb was in the recording industry. He records people like the Osmonds and um, Debbie Boone, quite different from the Beatles. But in order for Frank Sinatra and John Denver and for the Osmonds and the Boones to get their music sold, you have to wipe out Janis Joplin and Otis Redding and Mama Cass and all the great artists, the Presleys and the Beatles, so that you don't have this competition. And that's what was done. But Robert Haldeman worked with Ken Reitz and Mike Kerb. That doesn't mention, and many of you know those stories on the Nugan Bank, that Pat Boone in Australia, along with Daniel Ludwig, had a landing strip where heroin and narcotics were brought into this country. They're trying to find a joint on John Lennon while the CIA, the Nugan Bank, the admirals, and the generals have 22 stations all over the world and using Air America and the Flying Tigers bringing dope throughout every major city in this country and the corpses of soldiers from Southeast Asia. Now, Robert Haldeman is working full-time with David Murdoch, and uh, he's teamed up. With, Murdoch is teamed with Arm & Hammer and Occidental Petroleum. And this network is very powerful. They're merging corporations. They buy meat companies. They're working in China and Russia and all over the world. Libya, the, these gangs have spread and interlocked. The Murdoch uh, uh, connection is very interesting to Arm & Hammer. But... David Murdoch, but they all tie in with Haldeman, who works for Murdoch. Haldeman's father-in-law or father built the Murdoch building in Westwood. So these people, Hoover from Interpol with the Nazi group and Robert Haldeman with his Mike Curb Ken Reitz gang in Hollywood, uh, working at the studios and with recording artists that compete with the Beatles. They worked with the immigration authorities, the State Department, the CIA, and with that notorious Strom Thurmond from South Carolina. And I hope we have time this half hour to get into him, but if not, I'll do it next week. Now, Mr. Warner is writing a book, as I say. This material is heavily censored. There's approximately 300 pages in the Lennon file, and they'll only release one-third, and of the one-third, it's all blacked out. And they've uh, have used the American Civil Liberties Union for a lawsuit to the, for the right to see the files. I don't think they'll ever see the files because the pitch of this story now is that Richard Nixon devoted an incredible amount of government resource to try and get rid of them. But the truth is that there's no difference between Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan, and it was decided that Ronald Reagan would be president a long time ago, and Ronald Reagan lived through the bloodbath that was California, the Manson family with their links to the intelligence community, the Isle of Vista riots, the agent provocateurs in Los Angeles against the Chicanos, the People's Park, the San Quentin Six, the Soledad brothers. There was a bloodbath of his Gestapo mentality and counterintelligence agents and covert operations, the CIA working with the SLA. I mean, all of this is Sarah Jane Moore's wiping out the United Prisoners Union, the students, the peace people, the rock concerts. This is the ground that Ronald Reagan was nurtured in. 
and he knew what the Beatles could do. He knew what the rock musicians could do. So he had to have this guy dead before he took oath of office because, as I stated in the uh, San Jose Mercury and many times on the air, there's no way that Reagan could make the wars he's going to make and have the kind of person that John Lennon is alive walking planet Earth because if he decided to have a meeting, he could get a million people in one day and 24 hours, and there was no way that he could be around. Now, while Nixon invoked, had a lot of time and resources to get rid of him, he also created the COINTEL program and the mind control programs and the programs against the new left that still are intact. And they've just been taken out of mothballs, but they've been going on ever since. And one of the things John Lennon did, he went up to Michigan where a guy named John Sinclair was wanted for having two marijuana joints. He was put in jail for 10 years. He was sentenced for 10 years. The L.A. Times has the story about his uh, drawing a crowd of 16,000 and writing a song to free John Sinclair. And the government has these memos, let's try to get um, John Lennon, you know, find a joint on him, deport him. Can you imagine the hypocrisy? If you read these memos that are coming out of the book, that Mr. Weiner writes, or you see them, can you imagine the hypocrisy of Richard Nixon, who sits with the top cocaine bosses today in his home in New Jersey with a French connection, can you see John Mitchell, who was going at the time of the conventions, when they're out getting John Lennon, he was going to kidnap and he left us and radicals on the street and shipped them to Mexico for what purposes, like concentration camps. He was going to take them off the streets of Miami without committing a crime. He had floating whorehouses in Miami lined up to blackmail and compromise congressmen and, and be assured of votes or behavior later because they'd have all of them, you know, playing around with these women, these floating uh, ships. That was on the plans of the John Mitchell plans. They were wiretapping candidates and people that they didn't like. They were entering offices. They were stealing documents. They were forging. Richard Nixon was releasing the largest bunch of crime operatives in the entire world, giving them all pardons and getting them out of jail. It's a marvelous book put out with just page after page of the people that he released and the crimes they committed. E. Howard Hunt, again, was in the White House forging documents from the State Department when this was going on. And Frank Sturgis, who was also Frank Fiorina, who worked with Lee Harvey Oswald's doubles in Miami, and he was in Dallas when Kennedy was killed. Frank Sturgis was given by the IRS a church, and in the church they were storehousing weapons for violent action that they would blame the left for and for riots. So that if you read the history of Watergate, you see all the dirty tricks and chicanery planned through the entire year for the convention, and then they're going after poor John Lennon to see if they can just find the whiff of a joint. And, of course, when they couldn't find much on him and Lennon uh, goes back to England, then the CIA ships LSD over to them. John Lennon's wife almost died from the overdose from the dose of the LSD. This is before he met Yoko. And then Yoko introduced him to heroin and uh, Brian Jones of Rolling Stones, he was given some acid, some poison that came out of Oakland from the CIA. And the Beatles were given this kind of stuff and completely neutralized with drugs. They could zonk their heads out in their bodies if they couldn't catch them before the convention. They didn't stop when the convention was over. He wasn't going to Miami anyway, and that has to be made clear. John Lennon was a target. According to these documents in the L.A. Times, of the FBI offices, the information was sent to the Secret Service, to the U.S. Attorney's Office, the U.S. Naval Investigation in 1972. Imagine the Nugan Bank is going full swing, the narcotics from Southeast Asia, the admirals, the generals. In fact, one night I'll do a program just on the brass of the Nugan Hand. Bobby Inman, who was an admiral working with the Nugan Bank in Australia, working with Task Force 157 with Edwin Wilson and John Warner, Wilson living next door to John Warner, former Secretary of the Navy. Navy intelligence into espionage, Pine Ridge Gap down in Australia, but working with Wilson and Turple and Corkrell, the assassination team. They all work together. So this poor guy, John Weiner, wants to know, he was on television, asking a very simple question. Uh, why is the Reagan administration holding all this up or blacking it out? Because this was Nixon, and Nixon is over. That's about as sensible as people doing these constant studies of the concentration camps, the Holocaust, the Museum to the Holocaust, they're literally going to get down to count every bone that was found on the ground or above ground. 
The Holocaust is over because the people that did it went into Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford University, UCLA. They did a medical experiments. They're working for the State Department. They have names uh, that they've been changed, like Richard Pipes is from Poland, war criminals in Radio Free America. They're all over. They're on the campuses. They're everywhere. They are deciding the constant propaganda that you're getting every day about the Soviet Union. Those war criminals are here, and they're leading to you what Ronald Reagan calls that limited nuclear war. They've got you on the brink of being burned alive, and they're still worrying about the Holocaust. Well, this poor guy is worrying about what happened to Lenin in the 70s instead of the people that are power today and how John Lennon was murdered in 19. 19- 80, December 1980. That's the important thing because the dogs that did that run the government today and they're the same people dropping the napalm down in El Salvador today. Now in July 1968, the FBI counterintelligence operation began to attack law-abiding American citizens. And the information I have here comes from the congressional reports on the COINTEL program. The stated purpose of these assaults was to disrupt large gatherings. That's what the Beatles and the other musicians could get. To expose and discredit the enemy. That's what they did by drugging him and shipping the acid and the hard drugs to them and neutralize their targets, which is what they did. Lennon went into a cocoon, fought drug problems, was isolated, and the week that he's cutting a new record and he's emerged from all that terrible trauma of being isolated and drugged, he's cutting a record, and then it's time to gun him down because the boss is going to be inaugurated in a little while later, and you can't have Lennon around. The government said to neutralize, and they even suggested killing people, such as Martin Luther King, so they didn't have murder out of their mind. Now, in the congressional hearings on this, it it, it states the CIA director, Richard Helms, warned the National Security Council advisor, Henry Kissinger, the same man that ordered the murder of Salvador Allende and others, he warned him February the 18th, 1969, that their study on restless youth was extremely sensitive and would prove most embarrassing for all concerned if word got out that the CIA was involved in domestic matters. The FBI sent out a list of suggestions on how to achieve their goals, and these could all be applied to musicians, to rock festivals, and hippies along the way. On gathering information on their immorality, show them as scurrilous and depraved, explore impossible embarrassment, send women and sex and break up marriages. John had a marriage, and in comes Yoko Ono, Injection with heroin, which they said was a way to control John. There's a new book coming out on that. Investigate their personal conflicts and animosity. Send articles to papers showing their depravity. Use narcotics and free sex. Use misinformation. Confuse and disrupt. Get records of their bank accounts. Obtain specimens of handwriting so you can forge things that they said and target special groups. This was in the congressional reports of the COINTEL program. Now, December the 8th, 1973, this is after the convention is over. John Lennon is still in the country. He's fighting the deportation, and he didn't disrupt the convention, but they're after him and what his potential still is. A member of the the, uh, Immigration Service quit that Immigration Service. His name is Vincent Schiano, S-C-H-I-A-N-O. New York Times, December 8th, 1973. He left the Immigration Service. It, uh, it said because he didn't like what was going on there. He had his resignation from the immigration. He was quietly um, removed a year ago. Abruptly, he resigned yesterday under circumstances. He worked 20 years with immigration. Now, he was investigating Carlo Gambino, Mr. Shiano, Mrs. Hermoyne Ryan, the Nazi that was deported, about the only one, and John Lennon. John Lennon was the target of government action, and he disapproved he, He's the attempt to remove John Lennon and Yoko Ono. And one of the things he said he was hampered by his investigation of Nikolai Maloxa of the Iron Guard, who was sent to a front, the Western Tube, in the law office of Richard Nixon, uh, because the head of the Iron Guard, a Nazi war criminal, was sent to Nixon's office. They didn't want him to prosecute, and they interfered with the prosecution of him. But they wanted full scale against John and Yoko Lennon, and that's one of the things they wanted him to do. And he quit the office in 1973. 
Well, now I just want to remind you of a few back tapes that many of you have these tapes. Some of you don't on the John Lennon story and the chronology of it. And I bring it up just to show you that this information about John Lennon and the FBI and Navy Intelligence and Secret Service going after him didn't end with the Nixon era. The Nixon era never ended, and Reagan is the blood brother of all of that. One month before John Lennon was murdered, November the 2nd, 1980, I had a broadcast in which I said, rock musicians will have a hard time with the Reagan administration. And one of the people I mentioned on the printed sheet that goes with that tape, it's tape 465, was John Warner, Secretary of Navy. Now, John Warner lived right next door to Edwin Wilson of Navy Intelligence. Edwin Wilson, at the time of Navy Intelligence, was working with Strom Thurmond and with Thomas Kleins of Counterintelligence, the men that had offices in Geneva, Switzerland, where Mark David Chapman is to be in Geneva shortly. I also mentioned on the broadcast six important articles on the Nugenhan Bank. Now, uh, uh, John Lennon wasn't going to be murdered for one month, and it turned out that every city that Mark David Chapman went to or had contact with was a branch or part of the CIA Navy Intelligence Nugenhan Bank. And I knew the Nugenhan Bank was important, and on that broadcast a month before the murder of John Lennon, I gave six major articles that had come out up to that date, mentioned John Warner, and told the importance of this story. December the 7th, one night before John Lennon was murdered, on tape 470, he was murdered on December the 8th, 1980. I said the assassination teams from the 60s, from the 60s, are all in place. The 60s were not over. If not part of the murder, they were all part of the cover-up, and they're now ready to move again. Ronald Reagan, Ed Davis, Arlen Specter. Evel Younger, Paul Laxall, John McCloy, John Cooper, Leon Jaworski, John Tower, okay, Richard Allen, Richard Vagary, John Conley. And I mentioned the assassination teams that either were part of the murder or the cover-up. And on that broadcast, I mentioned a book that had come out called The Great Heron Coup by Heinrich Kruger, K-R-U-G-E-R. Because that's the link of Reinhard Galen's Nazis, Klaus Barbie, the death squads down in South America, the CIA, the narcotic wars. It was a book that came out in 1980 and a very important book. And then I mentioned several items about Frank Sinatra. There was a rumor that he would be our ambassador in Rome. And it's because uh, Frank Sinatra put on the inaugural ball for Reagan, but because the pop rock music broke up and interfered. The hand-selected kings of the music media, such as Tony Bennett and, and Frank Sinatra and the usuals from the 40s and 50s that are now surfacing again. The rock stars were done in. They drew a whole different audience. And I mentioned Frank Sinatra on that tape and the Great Heron Coup, which links to the news today. Now, one week later, after John Lennon's murder, I talked about... The Lennons, their last concert was in 1966, August, at Candlestick Park in San Francisco. We took all the children there. Maybe you know that. We took them to see that concert. They flew away to London. That was the last. By 1967, 68, the government made up their mind. They had to deal with John Lennon, with the crowds, with the new left, with the rock music, with the alternative press, and that's when the COINTEL program got into power. Not when the Beatles left this country, but what are we going to do with them later? In August 72, when they were worrying about deporting him, uh, John and Yoko were in San Francisco fighting the deportation and trying to understand what was going on in this country. And it's important to know that, that John Lennon's assassination, as I said, one week after he was murdered, or a week and a half after, I made several points. One, John Lennon's murder was one more of a long list of political assassinations to silence a man who wants peace and change, just change, an alternate way of doing things. Two, David, Mark David Chapman, the man who shot John Lennon, was brainwashed to a, 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 you know, a hired assassin. Three, Danton and peace are lethal words in a government geared to start World War III. If you don't believe that, send me articles of how much discussion there is about peace in this world. Everything you hear on the radio, TV, is what do the Russians have? What do we have? Do will they strike first? Do we have more? Who has the most? Do you ever hear any peace people being able to talk about an alternate to war? It's a question of who will win, how fast will it come, what weapons should we have? Where will we place them? How much will it cost? How much employment will it give? 
The only discussion going is war. Which countries the weapons go, where they drop, if an airplane, uh, military plane crashes, it's war, war, war. Are you sick of it? I am. I've heard it for so long. And I said that Danton and peace were lethal then, and they are now. The fourth point I made was that rock music and rock musicians have the potential for large crowds for anti-war purposes. They are the only social movement for peace. They feel the void. The church has failed. And if you don't believe it, just get out your books on the various rock musicians and read what they are saying. I remember at Monterey Pop when the birds were singing and they stopped in the middle of a song and said, I know CBS, I believe, was making an album of the concert or several albums. They said they won't include this and they won't mention who killed John Kennedy. There are constant references to politics, to government, to hypocrisy in the rock music of the era if you want to take the time to read them. I mentioned Operation Chaos and other federal projects have been geared to wipe out dissension, whether it's blacks, civic-minded leaders, musicians, or whether it's Harvey Milk, a supervisor in San Francisco who's gay, or George Moscone, the Dan White, Mr. Kling Dan White from the police department, from the fire department, who's going to go to Ireland this next June and live off the land in Ireland with his CIA connections, they can kill the mayor and the supervisor and get off treated with kid gloves. These murder teams are around. I mentioned that John Lennon and the Beatles had this potential to assemble, and Reagan wants war in Poland and in the Middle East as soon as Reagan is in. Now remember, he wasn't inaugurated when I was saying this on the air, and one of the objects of the May 1981 attempt to kill the Pope was an act of war to get a war going in Eastern Europe. And I talked about the escalation of the war after John Kennedy was murdered, according to the Pentagon paper accounts. And after Lenin was murdered, the war, he was a very important person. There's no congressman with the vitality. There's no one speaking up. And he was doing his music and getting ready to come out of his cocoon. And I, I did mention the prior warning, December the 2nd, just six days before he was murdered, there was a newspaper picture witness a fire burning Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band. The Zion Christian Life Center was saying the Beatles are dead. This Jim Peters was the head of it. They had a $50,000 fire of rock music and their headquarters in Minneapolis. And they were burning those records just four days before he died. And then within 10 days of his death, I had a chronology of, of uh, Mark David Chapman going to uh, DeKalb College, being the location in that county of the assassination teams that killed John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King, and then going with Tony Adams sent by the YMCA to Beirut, Lebanon, which is the home right now, Frank Turple's still there who set up the hit teams, the assassination squads, the torture squads, the training of the PLO, the Munich uh, assassins that worked with the Nazis in killing the Israeli athletes. Beirut is the headquarters of organized crime, of drug traffic, hit squads, and death teams. And he was sent there for six months and then to Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, where the Laotian tribesmen were brought, the CIA people that were building uh, their narcotics traffic, moving it to the Caribbean from Southeast Asia when they were kicked out. And then he went to Tennessee to a Presbyterian college at Lookout Mountain, Tennessee, and then to Hawaii where he married a Japanese gal. Oh, he went to Castle Hospital, a mental hospital where he could get a mind control job. And he meets a woman at a travel agency, and she arranges his trips to various countries around the world. And he's even uh, in London, as I said, a Beatle concert. In 1980, he has a paycheck book where he works as a security guard. He signs out on October 23, 1980, as John Lennon. Now, the purpose of a book to pay a guy when he comes back the next time or to know what time he leaves, you write in the book. But the man who had the book said he didn't see the name John Lennon until uh, Lennon was murdered. Well, how would you know whether to pay Chapman or not, whether he worked till 6 o'clock or 4 in the afternoon or what? He signs John Lennon and leaves. He flies to Atlanta, Georgia, and then New York City, then back to Hawaii, then to New York, December the 5th. He stays at the Sheridan. He stays at the YMCA or somewhere cheap the first night. Then he's at the Sheridan with a wad of money. He takes a cab and visits somebody on the east side before he goes to the Dakota where he kills John Lennon. He was very close to art galleries and called them frequently and went there in Hawaii. And, of course, you see Gulf and Western has big sugar holdings in Hawaii. Every major uh, espionage department of our 
country and the Japanese mafia, the stronghold over on the island is terrific. So he was in Hawaii where he gets his bucks to travel all over the world. And in any one of those places, they could have done the mind control job on him. Now, the important thing is that the emphasis now is not on the Laotian tribesmen. He was with it for Chaffee. It's not on what he did at Geneva, Switzerland, where Thomas Kleins and Edwin Wilson and Frank Turple ran their offices. They were behind the setting up of the murder of Sadat. They're not checking out Lookout Mountain, that uh, Christian Presbyterian College, or Jessica Blankenship that he was with her before. He married Gloria Abe, a Japanese a woman of Japanese heritage over in Hawaii. Not checking out the London safe houses. Remember Roberta Calvi, even the president of the Banco Ambrosiano got hung over in, in London. Uh, he was over there visiting in London, had connections to the main headquarters, as I say, of the Nugent Hand Bank in South Korea, in Japan, Hawaii, Geneva, Beirut, London, United States, and so forth. Mark David Chapman traveled all over. So the real story of the Beatles isn't uh, what Nixon wanted to do, Richard Nixon wanted to do to John Lennon. The real story is what's blacked out out of 300 pages. 100 pages are available. 200 are locked up, and of the 100, they're all blacked out. And they're blocked out because they don't want you to see them. Now, we'll go back next week. I'll do some more on John Lennon and Strom Thurmond a little bit more. And then I have some other matters I want to bring up with you. But time is running out now. So I'll say good night to you now. This is Mae Brussel at KAZUFM in Pacific Grove, California. And I'll be back with you next week.